Okay, so in your assignment three, and in the past lecture, and in the videos I asked you to watch, um, there was a focus on communicable disease models as examples of nonlinear models. Um, we need two to tango, we need susceptibles and infected, the infected, and then we'll want it together. And I'm listing up here common terms that you encountered in that, like I over N. What was I over N? What, what's the intuition of I over N? What is that? It's the right. fraction of the population that's infected, right? C times I over N. C was the number of contacts per day that a susceptible had with anyone. So C times I over N, where the number of contacts a susceptible would have had with a infected per day. Right. This this is like for the whole population, what fraction of infected. So if you if you say I I have contact as a successful with 100 people per day, and 50 percent of the whole population is infected, 0.5, then I have contact with 100 times 0.5 infected population per day. Like okay. Remember we talked about this before, and then you multiply by beta to get the force of infection, the approximate probability. Uh, that uh, a given successful will be affected per unit time. Remember that? You went through this? I want to make sure you can understand it from two perspectives. You actually alluded to the other perspective a little bit. So another useful way. So the you may recall that the when we had a model and we um successfuls and effectives. This formula was given by the number of susceptibles times this force of infection uh, here. So C times I over N times beta, right? Um, that's, that was the force of infection. So force of infection is this, and it's commonly denoted by the Greek letter lambda. So this is lambda times s, or this thing times s. Lambda is just the name for, for this. Okay, it's all right. Lambda. Yeah. Um, so if we have that, another way that we could fruitfully look at it is just by rearranging these terms. So if we have C, so, so this, we have this whole thing times x, right? Lambda times x. So you put a bar here to separate this. Okay. So I don't need this anymore. Maybe some of it is But um uh so this the formula for this flow is c times i over n times beta times x. Right? That's the formula for this flow. Are people comfortable with that? No one seems outraged at it. Okay, that's good. Um, um, so you can flip this around. I mean, in real numbers, we real numbers commute. Uh, it's a commutative field. I always know what I'm talking about. So, uh. So here we can actually flip this around to be C times S over N times beta times I, right? I, all I did is I, I flipped this too. People okay with that? Hearing no outrage, I'll continue on then. Um, so if we think about it this way, now we think from the perspective of each infective, C is the number of people they've total in contact with, S over N is the fraction of those people who are susceptible. So C times S over N here would be for each infective, the number of contacts they have per day with susceptible to average, right? And beta is the chance that they'll infect each of them. So this, this is kind of, the number of people that they're infecting per day. You get that? C 
see the number of total people they they're bumping into c times s over n is the number of susceptibles per day they're bumping into and each one they were probably beta of infected after all they're of infecting them after all they're this is from the perspective of an infective and and so c times s over n times beta is this number of people infected per day by an infected. Are people okay with that? Okay, I'm not hearing outrage, but it, it, like the crowd is also not going wild. Um, for some reason. So, okay, this is a, a key insight though. What this is saying is that a key throttle on how many people are infected by an infected is this term, S over N. What is the intuition of S over N? What is it? You can describe it like, I have one phrase, very crisp. What is what is S over N? In fact, fraction of the population that is susceptible. Right? Huh? Now let's consider. Okay, so this is the number of people per day. Per day. How if we consider it over their entire time infected? How many would they affect over their entire time infected? For one of these models where we have an average time infective of let's say mu, what would it be? Yeah, times mu. It's just C times S over N times beta. That's the number of people they are going to check on average per day times how long they're infected, right? And I'll, I'll call it mu less than I call it tau. So maybe I'll call it tau. Whatever I call it. This is, you know. Number of days, um, uh, you know, infectives uh, that they remain infected, right? Remain uh, infected that they they can spread. This is the number of people that they'll recover that they'll infect. Over the entire time period of their of their illness, and and this is called the effective reproductive number. Okay, um, it's it, and in fact, it's just f this fraction successful. We'll call it f here. F, in other words, f over n. The fraction is susceptible. So, so this is what's called effective reproductive number, or R star. It's also called R sub E or R sub T. And that's different from the basic reproductive number. Does anyone remember what the basic reproductive number was? Tony. And the whole point has over and one. And one. Meaning the entire population, other than that one infected, is what? Susceptible. So if, if F equals an N, other than the person we're, we're focused on, then R star, which in general is C times S over N times beta times tau is equal to, well, since S is N, these, these two cancel, so it's C beta times tau, right? In other words, it's C times one, the fraction is one, right? It's N over N. All right, it's N over N, which is equal to C beta tau. And this is the basic reproduction. So, what I'm introducing here, and I'll post these slides, but is, is this notion that there's this key 
there's this key quantity um, that is called F. It's the fraction susceptible. And if you try to understand the dynamics of infection spread, this is arguably the single biggest quantity to keep track of, to remember. Um, so uh, it directly impacts how many people an infective can impact, can, can impact per day or in fact, over the entire time period of their illness. If there's tons of people around them who are susceptible, they can be very efficient and effective people, if I can put it that way. If there are very few people around them that are susceptible, they'll be very inefficient. If only one, one out of 100 people around them are susceptible, this is going to be very small. They'll have to do a lot of work to affect them. You got that idea? Okay, so this susceptible fraction has a is a key throttling impact on the efficiency of transmission. Okay, um, and it comes out in this effective reproduction. The basic reproductive number asks how many people will an infective infect before they recover in an otherwise totally susceptible population. They're surrounded by susceptible. Everyone around them is just susceptible. How many people will they recover? Will they infect them? They can be very efficient at it. You see that? All of their contacts are with susceptibles. So they're not wasting any time. They affect C, they have contact with the total C people per day. All of them are susceptible. Each of them they infect with the probability beta or each of those contacts, and then they they're infected for top tau. That's that's the basic reproductive number this basic reproductive number. The effective reproductive number is the same as the basic reproductive number here, except it's times S over N. And it reflects the fact that it gets, if there's few susceptibles, it's harder to infect people and I'll infect fewer people okay, before I recover. The effective reproductive number asks, how many people will an effective infect before they recover in the current situation? And this depends, uh, like those same on those same factors that that we saw before. Now, I've introduced these terms partly to reason about tipping points of sorts. So, ladies and gentlemen. When we talk about an infectious disease, we're inter very interested in the basic reproductive number in part to know, will the infection lead to an outbreak? Will it lead to an epidemic? Will it be a really big sustained outbreak? If the basic reproductive number, if R0 is less than one for some infection, Maybe someone with that infection comes in, flies into the Saskatoon airport. Will there be an outbreak? Why not? Uh, so remember, basic reproductive number is one. The number of people they will infect before they recover, right? Scott, did you want to say something too? Yes. Online less than one, then they'll be. They won't be able to infect more people than they are. Exactly. By the time they recover, chances are they haven't even replaced themselves. I mean, there's a chance they might infect the person, but on average, they won't even replace themselves. And so many people who have it won't, won't, won't get anyone to stay in their place when they recover. And so it'll tend to die out. You know, it might infect one or two people, but it will tend to die out. If the basic reproductive number is greater than one, now you're dealing with a situation where it could start to spread, right? 
again, if the basic reproductive risk number is two, that would mean before I recover, I infect two people. Why could that be bad news for an outbreak? Because then what could those people do? They could each infect two, two, they could each infect two people, uh, therefore four people in total. And it could go from four, they're circa in different areas of the city. Those those four could infect two each, and it goes to eight, you see? And it compounds and it grows, 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 grows geometrically at first, as long as they're contacting different people who are susceptible. But the limiting factor ends up being this fraction infected, infection susceptible. Because more and more, as those go from one to two to four to eight to 60, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 124, et cetera, eventually they're going to start running into people who are not susceptible, right? And the fraction of susceptible population will start to drop. And so each effect will have to work harder and harder and harder to infect people. And that will limit the spread. And that limits the spread that we saw last time. And, you know, in, in, in any logic, right? I was going to draw it out. We might as well simulate it, right? Um, where initially you get this kind of doubling, 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 exponential rise for exactly these reasons, right? Um, it's, it's rising exponentially because each person infects, you know, one begets two, begets four, begets eight, but then it starts to it starts to reach up and limit itself because of this this lower number of susceptible ground. Do you remember what condition is true at this point? I don't remember what, was, what condition is true. I said it was two different levels: one from a population level. The deal with stocks and flows, and one from an individual level. So, on population level, what is true at that peak? Think about inflows and outflows. What is what is the case? If we think about this, if if we're plotting the number of infectives, and it's staying the same, it's not going up, it's not going down, it's in balance. What does that tell us about the inflow and outflow? They're equal. And in particular, the number of people getting newly infected per day is the same as the number of people recovering per day, right? Does it say nobody's getting infected per day? No, lots of people could be getting infected, but there's a lot of people recovering, right? Hmm. Let, let's, let's go look at the number of new infections here, right? Um, uh, this is now the number of new infections. We're gonna we're gonna simulate this out from the start here, and I'm gonna plot out. We have a plot of the number of infectives below, and we're gonna plot out the number of new infections. We've got to watch the time here. Only got about two minutes. So here we go. These are the number of of uh why isn't this okay here we go um okay here are the number of of uh of of new infections the number of new infections is a peak at at seven there is the number of people infective at a peak of seven when does it peak Number of new infections peaked at seven. It, it was at a maximum of seven. What is the maximum for the number of infectives here? Eight, right? Right? Here's the number of infectives, eight. It's, it's at a maximum at eight. Number of new infections is a maximum at seven. How could it be? How could, how could the number of new infections reach their peak when, when uh, the number of you know, and, and start going down, but the number of, of people infected is still going up. How can that be? Because one is greater than one. Inflow is greater than the outflow. It's the same. 
Folks, it's the same thing you did on this. Remember that? There was a peak in the flow earlier, but the stock continued to rise because inflow was going to outflow. Even though the flow was going down now, it goes down, you know, by from time seven to time eight, the number of new effects. But the stock continues to rise between seven and eight because inflow is greater than outflow. But what's the other thing that's true at that peak? At an individual level, what's true at the peak of the number of infectives plateauing? At an individual level, how many people is each infective infected? One person. So that means our star, the number of people being infected by each infective before they recover is what? One. So at that P, we have C times S over N times beta times tau equals one. And in general, when it comes into a situation of stasis where, where the number of perspectives is, is equal, you will have this being the case. Each effective affects exactly one person. And it's because the efficiency of their ability to affect people is limited by how many susceptible to them. Okay. So we saw the stock and flow resetting again. Uh, a new inflow can be highest at a different time than the stock is high. The inflow could be going down, but the stock could still be rising, right? This be bedeviled decision makers, believe it or not. And why are we why are we doing such a good job, you know, uh, having people um remit and placed in the community and, and and released to the community and our numbers being placed in the criminal justice system are, are dropping, but the number of people under incarceration is still rising. Well, inflow is greater than the outflow. Why are the number of people in the hospital going up, even though the number of new infections is going down? Because the number of new infections is greater than the discharges per day. Comes up again and again and again in terms of reason. I hope you see it here. Okay. Okay, so that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much. And many of you could get started on assignment three.